one. Let's see. Awesome. And are we live? We are live. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Kim Havens. I am the events manager here at An Unlikely Story. And thought I was going live on Facebook, but does not look like that is going to happen. So um, that's fine. Anyways, um, tonight we are here to meet Sean Thornton and Dale Arnold. Everyone in my family are fiercely loyal to the Bruins, so I'm particularly excited for this event. Sean's memoir is so honest and inspiring, I can't wait to hear him talk all about it with Dale. Before we start, I have a couple of technical tips. If you have any issues with the video or audio quality, just try refreshing your page. And if that doesn't work, just try leaving the presentation and logging back in and you will pop right back up. If you have any questions for Sean or Dale, you can enter them into the ask a question box, which is right down at the bottom of the screen. And we will get to them towards the end of the, after they talk about the book. We have the green button in the center bottom of your screen. Purchase Fighting My Way to the Top by Sean Thornton and Dale Arnold. Dale is gonna stop in the store next Tuesday to sign books and personalize them. So click on them and just add into the comments how you would like your book signed. Tonight, Sean and Dale are going to talk about Sean Thornton's candid memoir, Fighting My Way to the Top, in which he opens up about his life in hockey and beyond from his early days as an unrated prospect to the leadership lessons he learned in the minors. Sean played for the Chicago Blackhawks, the Anaheim Ducks, Boston Bruins, and Florida Panthers during his 14 seasons in the NHL. He joined the Panthers executive staff following retirement and currently serves as the team's chief commercial officer. Thornton won two Stanley Cups with the Anaheim Ducks in the 2006 2007 uh, Anyways, and the Boston Bruins in the 2010 to 2011 season. Season, that's the words I was looking for. He became the only player in professional hockey history to begin his career after expansion and play in over 700 NHL games and 600 American Hockey League games. He's the only player this century to record 10 fights, score 10 goals, and win the Stanley Cup in the same season. He founded the Sean Thornton Foundation in 2013, which is dedicated to help finding cures for diseases close to his heart, specifically Parkinson's and cancer. Through his foundation, Thornton holds an annual Pucks and Punches for Parkinson's golf event and does charitable work throughout Boston and South Florida. He joins us from Parkland, Florida, where he lives with his wife, Erin, and their daughters. Dale Arnold is the host of Boston Bruins television broadcasts on NECN. He recently retired after 30 years as a sports talk show host in Boston. He's the only person to have done play-by-play -play for all five Boston professional sports teams. And he is also the author of If These Walls Could Talk, Boston Bruins. And we were lucky enough to welcome him here at the store for that book. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Dale Arnold and Sean Thornton. Hi, Kim. Hello. Hi, everybody. Awesome. Hi. Thanks. We are talking about one of my favorite bookstores in all of New England. And uh, when the first book came out, I got to go to a lot of different places. And an unlikely story is one of my favorites, not just because it's a town down from where I'm living, but it's such a cool place. And uh, at some point in the future, once Kim told Sean that they serve beer and wine and cocktails, he now wants to come visit the, the place as well, right? 100%. And an unlikely story sounds like my story as well, so it kind of fits. Just to give you guys a, a brief uh, synopsis of how this happened, uh, Triumph Books wanted me to write another book. And they said, pick somebody you want to write a book with or about. And, and I called Sean. And uh, we've been friends for a long time. I've known him pretty well. He, uh, he doesn't like to talk about himself. I had to kind of talk him into doing this whole thing. Uh, I did talk him into it. We signed a contract in January of uh, 2019, about a month before COVID shut the country down. Um, we wrote this entire book on the telephone, the entire book. Uh, every word that Sean says in the book, every interview with every player was on the phone. In fact, I didn't see Sean during this entire process until about 10 days, two weeks ago. 
uh, when he came up to Boston when the Panthers were in town. Uh, so I'm not sure that it was exactly the process, Sean, you were expecting. No. But I am happy with the product that we ended up with. Yeah, I agree. Uh, no, definitely not the <clears throat> way I envisioned this coming together. I mean, we had talked about it. I, I thought I'd be flying up to Boston like I normally do, seven to ten times a year for different events, getting together, you know, bringing you. There's a lot of people in the book that uh, that contributed that I know personally, but it ended up being phone calls with them. My idea was to sit around, have a beverage, hot stove, tell stories, let you just feel what the interaction was like with myself and, and my my you know other close friends and family, and and really have the book develop out of there. But uh, as you said, it turned into countless hours uh, on the on the telephone as much as I love talking to you uh, it made it not painful which was uh which was nice but um so everyone on the call knows I like we said I'm the chief commercial officer for the Florida Panthers now so I oversee revenue content and uh, and a bunch of other things and my day is filled with zoom calls and teams calls and uh so when Dale's like do you want to do this I'm like yeah but we're talking on the phone old school because I can't do one more Zoom call uh, in my <laughs> spare time. So uh, really old school. But yeah, no, I'm happy with how it came out. Uh, most importantly, I mean, I, I have a tough time talking about myself uh, and it's never easy. But, you know, I've talked to a few people that have read it since uh, since it was released and some people that are very straight shooters and not afraid to be critical of me in the past, whether public or private. And uh, both were very uh, pleased with it. So um, I appreciate the feedback. So um, it listen, I, it's a it's a tough thing to do, tough thing to open up and tell people about your life. But uh, if anyone, you know, drives some inspiration from it, and, you know, ends up being a success story out of not giving up, then, then I'm then I'll be happy if we put it out or that we put it out. I'll tell you another another quick story when we were in the process of deciding whether Sean was going to do this. Uh, he did say to me at one point, he said, if we do this, we have to tell the truth. Even if I don't look too good at times, even if there are things in there that I'm not proud of. Uh, he said, but we have to tell the truth. And to give you an example of what he meant by that, we wrote an entire chapter about the Brooks Orpic situation that earned Sean the only suspension of his career, a 15 game suspension for what happened with Brooks Orpic. We wrote the whole chapter, it was done, it was finished, it was in the can. And Sean called me and he said, here's Brooks Orpic's phone number. <clears throat> I called him, I told him you were gonna call and I told him to say whatever the bleep he wants to say. And I did, and he did. And uh, that's, what, that, that's what Sean meant by, we have to tell the truth. We have to tell it like it really is, no matter what the, the scenario was. Yeah, I wanted other people to chime in as well. I mean, my friends from junior, uh, it, it's one thing for me to say that I was not very highly rated and all this stuff, but uh, those are just my words and I could be pumping my own tires or creating my own narrative, but to hear other people echo the same sentiments, uh, I think adds a little bit more weight to, to the story as well. So yeah, I'm a, anyone that knows me personally knows I'm a very, very, very straight shooter. There's no, uh, no gray area with me. So uh, I wanted to make sure the book reflected that. A uh, quick story about the cover of the book. For those of you who maybe have seen it uh, on, on the website for an unlikely story, a uh, few people have the book now if they were lucky enough to have attended the event that we had at, at Encore, which was kind of the kickoff event about 10 days, two weeks ago. Uh, initially, the publisher came to us and said, you know, here's the picture that we want to use on the cover. And it was a, a picture of Sean in a shirt and tie, you know, being an executive, which he is now. And I said, that's not the guy I'm writing about. That's not him. <laughs> and I had read this article, this magazine piece, uh, as part of the, the research for doing this. I had read this thing and there was a picture in it that just jumped out at me. And I got a hold of Triumph and I said, here's the book, here's the magazine article, here's the picture. You've got to go buy this picture. You have to buy this. And they said, you're right. We do have to buy it. And that's the, now, then I had to explain to Sean's wife, Erin, why I wanted to put this picture on the cover of the book. Thankfully, she said, I kind of like it too. So we were okay. <laughs> yeah, correct. And uh, again, I don't even like looking at myself. So this is gonna, gonna be weird when this is in places that I can't avoid it. Um, but yeah, no, the, the, the magazine was kind enough to, to introduce us to the photographer. A while ago, I took that photo, uh, obviously, because you can tell I look a lot younger, but uh, yeah, 
Listen, I'm glad how it turned out, although the fact that I have to look my own face. Yeah, when he goes through an airport and sees that all over the bookstore shelf, it's going to be a little hard to escape that one. Yeah, it'll be the time I'm actually okay wearing a mask, hopefully hiding, <laughs> a hat, hopefully hiding myself. Uh, just a quick synopsis, and we're not going to give the whole book away. We'll, we want you guys to read it. But Sean spent a long time in the minor leagues. I spent eight years broadcasting in the American Hockey League, riding those buses. I know what it was like. Sean spent a lot of time in the minor leagues as well, so much so that he basically didn't think it, it was going to happen. And in fact, he gave himself one last chance, I guess, Sean, to one more try. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, I'll be, go become a policeman or a fireman or something. Yeah, too claustrophobic to become a fireman. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, my wife and I talked about it. And I spent 10 years basically full time, nine years full time in the minors with a couple cups of coffee. With the Chicago Blackhawks, uh, I think you know five years in that organization. I was probably up for 100 games, played 30, and I was just had to look at myself in the mirror and say, "Can I keep playing in the minors until I'm 35, 36, 37? And what am I going to do afterwards?" So um, I was coming up on the pl place in my life that I had to start thinking. I was always thinking about the next step, but it was you know at an inflection point almost that what are we going to do? So I said, "One more organization. We've only been in two. Let's try one more. If we don't make it, then." Uh, we'll move on to the next step, which would have been a police officer. And I was, you know, making I was making headway on on going down that that path. Uh, and then, you know, thank heavens that uh, the Anaheim Ducks gave me a contract, and I ended up being a small spoke on the wheel and, and winning a cup that year. And you know, we wouldn't be having this conversation uh, with fine young people on this uh, on this call if that if that didn't happen. Sean was a part of what the Bruins called the Merlot line back in 2010, 2011. And Merlot, while it's a very fine wine, it had more to do with the fact that they wore maroon practice jerseys. Each line in practice wears a different color jerseys, the yellows or the greens. Or, and Sean's line wore maroon and it looked like Merlot. So they became the Merlot line. And every single person I talked to <clears throat> over the course of this book, Zdeno Chara, Patrice Bergeron, Mark Recchi, lots, all said, we don't win the cup if it wasn't for the play of the Merlot line that year. And I know you take a lot of pride in the fact that you guys were key contributors to that cup. Yeah, I mean, again, tough for me to talk about or say that we were an integral part. I mean, I was blessed to play with two very gifted line mates and brought me along for the ride. Uh, it's great to hear my teammates talk about the importance of that line and during their our cup run, but uh you know i think i was a small spoke on the wheel still a little bit bigger than than anaheim felt like it was more part of the team but we won the cup and that's all that really matters it doesn't matter if you're a huge part small part you're part of a team that you know does what everyone in their whole lives is plays hockey is waiting to do and just lucky i'm very fortunate i was able to do it twice and with the amount of time i spent in boston seven years i mean being able to do it there it, it meant it meant the world to me How did a kid from Oshawa become so enamored with the city of Boston? Because you're still connected to the city today. Uh, I was just living there. I mean, uh, my I had people that I played with in the minors that played college in Boston and were from other places, and they always seemed to move back there. And I was like, there's got to be something to the city. So when we signed there, I didn't know anything about it. Didn't know anybody on the team. I'd been to Boston one time before. I think we were playing the Lowell, whatever they are at the time, and took the train in with a buddy. Uh, tried to catch a Sox game, couldn't get a ticket, um, and then went back at the Wolves. So I didn't know anything about the city at all. Uh, but, you know, I got there and we just fell in love with it. We sold our house in Canada and said, let's try this, play. like, let's really embrace it. And once you get there and get to know the people and get to know the communities and uh, get to know the city and, and the fan base, there's nothing, you know, there's not many places. I don't know if there's anywhere, anywhere better, and it's comparable to a lot of places that might be said to be better. So we... We really just dove right in, lived in Charlestown, and, but just, again, how they embraced us, very fortunate. I've uh, talked to a lot of tough guys over the course of my career. When I wrote the first book, I talked to some of them. And some, admittedly, are starting to think about the effect, the toll that was taken on their bodies with the way they made a living. Uh, you're probably not going to be surprised to hear Sean's not one of those. Uh, <laughs> He makes no apologies for how he made his living. And, and as he said, I'm not giving back any of the money or the houses. I'm going to just keep get doing what I do. Yeah. I mean, listen, it wasn't an easy way to make a living. It was never an enjoyable 
way to make a living, uh, meaning the, the getting punched in the face. I, I, I've never met anyone that truly enjoys getting punched in the face, but it's one thing I was always, I guess, good at, uh, was sticking up for myself and other people. Um, and, and ended up being able to turn that into a, in a, into a profession. Now, obviously I had to work really, very, like really hard on my game. Uh, the pugilistic skills is what got me in the door, but, uh, there wasn't a place really for a guy that couldn't play anymore at it. And I wouldn't have been playing 10 minutes a night if I couldn't, uh, adapt and, and play a bigger game. But yeah, the, the fighting got me in, uh, I have my hands a little messed up, I guess, but other than that, uh, I'm in pretty good shape. No, the nose looks fine too. Oh yeah, well this thing does. <laughs> there have been a few times where that may have been involved in, yeah, that's, that's in any true. of this that's stuff. True. Yeah, it looks a little different on did the back you, of my junior hockey card than it does now. Did you ever have doubts about what you were going to do that night? Did you ever say, oh, I don't know about this one? Uh, yeah, all the time. I think there's a few in my career that I really wasn't looking forward to that I knew would uh, eventually happen. Um, but again, you're I'm doing my job. I mean, it, it, I signed up for it, right? So, uh, well, it was not enjoyable. You know, it, it's what I was paid to do. What I was getting paid to do. And I'll tell you right now, it's a lot easier to do it in the NHL than it is when you're making the league minimum in the minors. And when I really take a step back at it and look where I came from, uh, it's not all that bad compared to my buddy that's a cop and has to kick in doors and go into buildings and not knowing whether he's going to get shot at or. Like you said, a fireman that has to crawl through tight spaces with a fire. I mean, it's all relative, right? So tough job in the world of hockey, but in the grand scheme of things, maybe not as tough as you think. You know, we were talking about how you embraced Boston. And I should point out, uh, there is probably not another hockey city in North America that embraces the tough guy, quote unquote, the way Boston does. And you can go way back in history and you can talk about Terry O'Reilly, whose number is hanging in the rafters in mm -hmm. that building and Jay Miller, and, and Stan Jonathan, and P.J. Stock. The city of Boston, New England in general, loves guys who play the game the way you play the game. Agreed. Uh, it's in the book. I mean, when Cam called me uh, on July 1st before I signed with Boston, it was, you know, I had a few other options. He was trying to explain to me what Boston was going to be like. He said, you know, I've seen players such as yourself come through here, and I just got to tell you that it's – they really relate to a player like you uh, and, and the city embraces them and loves them. And might've been the understatement of my, my career. He really undersold it, but uh, it did resonate with me. And I mean, yeah, Terry's in the, Taz is in the rafters. I mean, Stalker, I love the guy, but he played like 40 games there and they're still talking about him uh, as, a, as a legend. And he was, Stalker was tough as nails, I fought him. Um, but it truly shows what that, what that town's like. I mean. The only other place I can really think about it is my hometown, uh, a guy like Ty Domi, um, Colt Nor a little bit when he played there, uh, former Bruin. But those guys, you know, this town, they, they love the blue collar, hard nose. I don't know if it's the, you know, the boroughs of Charlestown, Southie, Dorchester, uh, just kind of how they're built in their DNA, uh, fighting their way out of it. Um, they, they really do embrace it. And, you know, I was lucky to be, I was lucky to be that guy. I want you guys to read the book, so I don't want to give too much away, but Sean mentioned Ty Domi, and there is a great Ty Domi story in the book, which would probably ruin the impression Bruins fans have of that guy. <laughs> I would say that. Ty's got a big heart. When you get to know Ty, he's a, he was a mentor to me uh, all the way through to the end. Uh, I used to call him all the time and pick his brain on different situations I was going to be put in. Uh, you know, Ty has a book out, and uh, as you know, he I think he fought, I think it's 333 or something. He fought 333 times in the NHL, and uh, he's five foot nine, five foot ten, taking on guys a lot bigger and, and arguably a, a, a tougher era. I mean, we crossed we crossed over a little bit in the NHL, but you'd argue some of the guys he had to take on in the uh, early 90s were, you know, toughest that have never been around. So, uh, you know, Ty, Ty's a great human being, uh, proud to call him a friend. For those of you who are watching live and not on, on a tape delay basis later on, uh, David Posternak just scored in the Bruins lead the Edmonton Oilers one to nothing. I just feel <laughs> compelled to give you those scoring updates as we can. Uh, you don't have the Panthers game on? What's going on? I, you know, I just thought I'd have the Bruins game on instead tonight. How is your team doing, by the way? Yeah, it's still 0-0, it's still so. 
Uh, Kim, if, if there are questions that uh, any of our viewers or listeners have, please feel free to jump in here. I mean, believe me, we've talked hundreds of hours already. We can talk all night if, if you want <laughs> us to. But, but if there are questions out there that Sean can answer, we'd be happy to do that too. Yes, I don't see any yet. Okay, so you guys, oh, now the Oilers just scored and it's 1-1. One, one. Uh, <laughs> Please, please guys, ask me because I, I, I hate talking about myself. I'd way rather field questions than me have to talk about myself. So please chime in, anybody. I will uh, I will tell people that the foreword to the book was written by Tuka Rask. And that may surprise some people who probably, they're, they're the ones who don't know that that's probably your best friend from your Bruins days was Tuka. Yeah, he's, he's definitely up there. I mean, uh, he's coming down here next week. Uh, I'm going to see him talking to him today. I mean, it's, yeah, Tukes, Shane Knighty, probably the two closest friends I came out of my playing days. I played with Tukes a lot longer. Still talk to Knights all the time. Um, Tukes and I have uh, some mutual friends outside of hockey that, that we met that, uh, you know, we're really close with. So uh, we're, as on the outside looking in, we look like we couldn't be two more uh, different individuals. But once you get to know us, we're very similar in our uh, attitude towards life, uh, other than the fact that he had to stop pucks and I got punched in the face. But I, I guess you could argue that maybe they're one and the same on, on getting hit by things. But just a laid back, great, great individual that uh, I'm proud to call a friend. As uh, former Bruins goaltender Jerry Cheevers once said to me, when one of the great shooters is coming down on you, one of two things can happen. And the bad one is that it hits you. I mean, <laughs> and you're supposed to throw yourself in front of these things, and that's what Tuka did and does. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Now he's a, he's the ultimate professional and uh, an even better individual. <laughs> these are great questions. We have a couple Stephs in the audience, and one okay. <laughs> Bodoin says, "We love you, Shawnee Dangles." <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Oh, she I'm saw the penalty shot. Dangles. Oh, she, she must saw have the penalty shot, right? Yeah, uh, must be. And uh, Steph Burrows would like to know, Sean, did you listen to music before games? And if you did, what bands, songs, genres? Oh, yeah, I was all over the place, uh, depending on the mood, my playlist. And obviously, I played for two decades, so it changed over time as well. Um, everything from, I mean, Foo Fighters to Pearl Jam, like an alt rock to... Uh, rap and uh i wasn't so much a country guy before games a little bit too chill mm -hmm. um but definitely heavy alternative and rap hip-hop before games those are my uh those are my two go-tos oh awesome um i love in the prologue prologue that the first sentence is boston bruins fans were pissed <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> hey, we, get pissed, we are really pissed <laughs> um that was a great. Can you tell us a little bit about that story? Because I was like, wait, so they already decide ahead of time that they're going to fight? Like, that just kind of blew my uh, mind. It was, a, it was Sean a decided. Yeah, it was a <laughs> foregone conclusion that was probably even out of my control. Um, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't really I get the book to tell the whole story. But at the end of the day, there's three reasons to do what you do, uh, what I did for a living, fight for land. Three reasons to get your gloves off. First and foremost, stick up for a teammate. Secondary, stick up for yourself. Third is to change momentum of a game, which doesn't happen as much as they, anymore. But when I was playing, that was a, a huge motivator for uh, why two guys would go and you know punch each other in the face for what seemed to be no reason on the outside looking in. But mm -hmm. one of my teammates was hurt. I had to defend him, and yeah, it was uh, it was bound to happen, whether it was me or, or someone else. And but my role on that team in that year, uh, I felt it was my my job, my duty to to take care of it. I will also say that one of Sean's teammates, and I'm not going to give too much away from the prologue chapter, which is the way we really wanted to open the book. But one of Sean's teammates said, you, meaning Sean, made it very clear it was going to be no one else. <laughs> you made it very clear it was going to be you. Yeah, it was my job. There's other people that wanted to do it. I will give them credit. There's a lot of other people that wanted to do it. All right. So Lauren is asking for her son, who is currently in a college class and can't be on. He wants to know how you feel about your Matt Cook retaliation fight for Mark Savard. 
Well, that's kind of what we're talking about right yeah, now. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. That's yeah. why I'm like, all right, I'll chime it in. Yeah. The uh, listen at the end of the day, it, it had to happen. Um, yeah. I will give Matt Cook the credit where credit is due. Uh, at that time, I think I had you know 300 and something fights in my career. I'm not sure he had even 15. Uh, and, and he stepped up and, and got the gloves off with me. So um, obviously, I think. It, there was also going to be a foregone conclusion in my mind that I was winning that fight no matter what happens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he may have had the same conclusion, but he he stepped up and and did what he had to do. So uh, I, you know, it's unfortunate what happened to Savvy. Uh, yeah. Very unfortunate. But I'm I have to give credit where credit's due with Matt Cook. He he could have chose another path and the game would have went a different way. But he took he took his uh, took his lumps. He did take his lumps. All right. So this question is for Todd. He says, "Hey, Thorny." When you played in Florida, you fought Cater, Q U A D E R. Yeah, Quader. Yeah, Adam Quaid. Quaid. Yeah. Quaid. Okay. Did you know it was him when you grabbed him, and did you guys ever talk about it? One hundred percent, I knew it was him when I grabbed him. Uh, I actually asked him off the draw before that. We were down like three or four nothing, and back to the momentum changes. Um, he was the toughest guy on the ice at the time, and I thought, you know, maybe Quader. I, I kind of groomed him as uh, one of my mentees when I was playing um thought maybe he'd give me a give me a favor and get them off it didn't happen but he uh he then finished his check on one of my teammates uh I don't know if it was a little bit late or whatever it was but it gave me a window of opportunity to to grab him uh Quater's a good friend he was a teammate the year prior um I he was actually at my house for dinner the night before and brought me my mail from Charlestown which probably sounds <laughs> served to some people but at the end of the day when those doors close it's 200 by 85 it's your team versus them and, and friendships go out the window he, he wasn't the first friend or ex-teammate i had fought um and he knew it was a job too i, I went over right it, it, like immediately after the game i think i was still in my towel uh and, and hugged it out with him so uh, you know i was talking to him last week me and quater we're still on good terms don't worry it's just a job <laughs> We That's should awesome. also tell people that while Adam McQuaid is one of the quieter people I've ever been involved with in the game, uh, he might be one of the tougher as well, isn't he, Sean? Yeah, he's a tough, he's a very tough individual. He's big, strong, uh, has a quiet, mean streak to him and a heavy right hand. So I tried to stay away from that right hand. <laughs> oh, all right. So Jasmine has a question. What is your favorite season slash team you played on excluding a Stanley Cup win? Oof, that's a good question. That is a good one. Uh, seasons are tough, a little bit tough. Uh, I got a couple actually. Um, some moments, probably like the Winter Classic was an unbelievable moment for me and like being able to play at Fenway. Uh, I don't think the season went so well for me, like statistic wise, but that experience was, was great. And, um, my last year in Florida was pretty good too. Um, I had expected to retire. My contract was up and uh, I thought I was done. I was moving on to the business side or I hadn't even decided yet whether I was moving on to this business side or, or moving back to Boston to do TV, radio endorsements and work with the Bruins in some capacity. Um, and ownership called and said, hey, we'd like you to play another year, sign for another year. You might not play a single game, uh, but we want your leadership around the locker room for our young core that's uh, we're still grooming. and." I took the opportunity, played another year, and I ended up playing like 60 games or something. And a lot of it was because my team, my teammates uh, wanted me in the lineup. So that final year uh, and how I was treated on the way out, uh, it, it, beyond what would be expected for a player of my pedigree or caliber, that's for sure. So pretty special that my teammates treated me that way and ownership. Wow. Oh, here, here's a comment from Danielle. Took my dad to a Bruins versus Dallas Stars game years ago. I promised him that there were rarely fights. Sean started a fight immediately after the puck dropped. There were four <laughs> fights in the first two minutes. It was great. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, I was the first. I'll, I'll tell you this: that 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 game was an entire chapter in the book. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't my. Uh, I didn't start the first fight. I was asked after the first fight happened uh, by somebody who did the same job on the other side, who I had actually mentored a little bit in the minors and taught him. The basics of how to do it and he took it and ran and, and did a really good job uh so yeah and then there's yeah, one right after me and then i think another one later in the game uh <laughs> and then we ended up rallying around it and winning so yeah, i remember the game pretty well <laughs> <laughs> all 
All right, so Brendan has a question. Following the Boston Marathon bombing, what was the reaction in the locker room? And did it affect the mindset of the team on the run to the cup final? 100%. Uh, we personally knew some people uh, that were running. Uh, I, I didn't personally know at that time anyone that was immediately affected uh, mm -hmm. by, the, by the terrible tragedy, but um, we definitely took it and rallied. You know, Boston's a strong town. We mm -hmm. uh, we, we took that and, and really rallied upon, around it. We wanted to, you know, do something special for the city, and we almost got there. We really did. Um, it was uh, it was an event that nobody expected. We have a friend, uh, myself and Andy Ferris were really close to them back then, that was former army ranger that served and uh, he had crossed the finish line minutes before uh those happened he turned around and was doing turn kits and uh telling us a story about it a couple nights later over beers and it wasn't easy to hear that's for sure so yeah we took it to heart yeah that was a tough day i worked yes. at wellesley books and we're right on the wellesley's like right on the route and so yep. there I am at work, and then the cops were coming through and going through all the trash cans. And I'm like, this is just weird. The Bruins had a game that day against the yeah. Ottawa Senators. Yeah. And we were all in the building. And uh, I was in the Nesson Studios and getting ready to do the game. And I, I went downstairs, and Sean mentioned Andy Ferentz. I saw Andrew down in the hallway. And I said, what do you think? And he said, there's no bleeping way we can play this game tonight. And yeah. he was adamant. And they didn't play that night. Yeah, there was three of us in the training room, I think. Like three, it was like myself, Andy, maybe one or two other guys. We got there a lot earlier than most guys uh, to get ready for the game, maybe because of our old age. We needed a little longer to warm up. But uh, I remember Peter Shirelli coming through, and we were just waiting to see what was going to happen. And again, when this happened, when it happened, it was a little great. Nobody knew exactly what was going on. Everyone was trying to speculate and how bad was it really going to be. Like in the real time, uh, it, it was tough to understand. So we are it was about four o'clock. Peter came down and he's like, game's canceled, guys. Go home. Be with your families. So uh, you probably saw him just after that on his way on his way out of the yeah. arena, I'm assuming. Yeah. Wow. All right. So this question is for Jennifer C. With all the great players and hockey minds you've been around your entire career, who have you learned from the most, both on and off the ice? Ooh, that's a tough – I've been around a lot of great ones. You're right. Uh and tried to take a little bit from every single individual I've ever played with. I um, probably didn't learn enough from any of them, to be completely honest, uh, <laughs> even though I tried to. Uh, that's a tough one to narrow down. I mean, played with a guy like Scott Niedemeyer, who was the most, you know, laid back, mild mannered, uh, but hardest working, gifted individual that I've ever played with. And, and seeing his leadership style versus uh, Chris Pronger that year, who was very vocal uh very physical very uh in your face uh, two completely contrasting styles but both led very effectively in their own way and like you get to i get to boston and i'm graced with the pleasure of playing with mark recce who's probably in my opinion one of the greatest leaders i've ever played with um and how he helped rub off on another one named patrice bergeron and and zdano Ch chara um and you know Z's work ethic, Bergie's work work ethic, uh, the professionalism uh, amongst all of these individuals that I'm talking about, way more professional than I am. To be completely honest, I try some days, but uh, they take it they take it to another level. Um, guys like Shane Knighty, who didn't play a big role on the teams we were on, but behind the scenes had one of the biggest leadership roles you could ever imagine. Uh, one on one accountability, uh, talking to guys in a way that. Uh, didn't offend them, but really made them aware of where they were uh, if they weren't self-aware at the time. So uh, PJ Axelson, Glenn Murray, I mean, played with so many great leaders. It, it's really tough to narrow it down. I could go on for hours and weeks about uh, the great leadership that I've been around and very fortunate of it. And like I said, just tried to steal a little bit of all of them to put into my own little concoction. I'll add one, one other name to that list, but I want you to read the book to read about him. Just read about Bird Dog Smith. Yeah, that's all bird you have dog. to do. <laughs> bird dog, he's a legend. That is awesome. All right, so Jasmine has a question. What kind of off ice workouts would you recommend for a 14 U player? Ooh, good question. I wasn't even working out at 14, so I might not be the right <laughs> person to ask. The game's definitely changed that way. 
Um, I'll say this. I played for a long time and I was the hardest, one of the hardest working players on every team I played on because I had fun doing it. It never felt like a job and never felt like a chore. The more fun you have, the harder you work at it, the better you'll get. So um, at 14, probably not changing whether he's going to be a first line center in the NHL, a fourth line in the AHL, unless he's having fun doing it and, and making sure that uh, he's mentally engaged as he is physically. Wow. So I have a question, Sean. So you really uh, have given back even, you know, with the kids in Parkland and, um, and along with your foundation, can you talk a little bit about that? I just think it's, it just warmed my heart. Uh, giving back. I mean, I, yeah, as I was asked later on in my career, what I would be most proud of being remembered for this fight, that fight, the Stanley Cups, the mm -hmm. life of your career. My answer every time was how, how I gave back. I think that uh, mm -hmm. we have a platform. Uh, we're very lucky to be in a space to be able to give back and people care about what you're doing and uh, to be able to use that for good. I think it's, uh, it's not, it's what you're supposed to do. It's not like, you know, it's just, but a lot of people it's don't. It's how it's raised to use, you do it, you can. If you, uh, if you read the book, read what Fred Gutenberg has to say about his friend, Sean. Fred's daughter, Jamie, was one of the children killed in the Parkland shooting. And Fred wanted to talk to me about Sean as a friend. Hey, let's go get breakfast today. Let's let's go have a cup of coffee. That's what Fred wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't a part of that, by the way. I got to tell you. Uh, I know. My CEO, Matt Caldwell, I, I wanted him to be interviewed for the book and just talk about how I got onto the business side because people are a little intrigued on how a guy that got punched in the face for a living is going to become a level <laughs> executive at some point in that. I wanted Matt to talk to Dale about that. And it, Matt took it upon himself to introduce Dale to Fred and say, you should talk to him because Sean never will. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you this, when I called Fred, he was so excited to be able to talk about Sean. He, he said, I can't thank you enough for giving me the chance. And he and I still communicate to this day. He seems like such a great guy. We've never met because of the whole phone call thing, but he right. seems like such a great guy. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's a really, really good guy. I know, I love that chapter. That was just, so when did you find out? Like, what did you think, Sean, the first time that you got to read the book? Well, I read it a bunch, because I had to prove yeah. it a few times. Uh, and I don't like <laughs> reading about myself, so it's very tough. Um, yeah. The first time, I mean, I just saw it, what was it? 11 days ago, it was the first time I actually got the physical copy and showed up at my door. Uh, I was like, that's real, I guess. Yeah, that <laughs> happens. So. <laughs> wow. so I haven't, I, it's because I proofed it so many times and, you know, we lived it and talked. Mm -hmm. and most of these are my stories anyways. I haven't physically, like, opened this up and, like, read it in its hard copy form. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I will. I may, Maybe I will. I don't know. Maybe I'll look at the pictures. So. You should. <laughs> you definitely should. And so how did you guys do this? Like, so you're on the phone. You're not meeting in person. And how, first of all, how did you talk him into it, Dale? Um, I told him I thought he had a, a good story and a, and a story that I thought would help people. And ultimately, if you say to Sean, hey, I think you can help someone, that usually will get him on your side. <laughs> you tell him that he can help someone. Um, but you know, I, I don't want to make it sound like this. It was this months long negotiation. The first time I called him, he said, I don't know. You know, why would I do that? And, um, and I know that he's not comfortable talking about himself. After about two or three conversations, he kind of realized, you know what? We can do this. And and if you know Sean, you know that if he says yes, it's yes. It's full bore. If he says, hey, I'll talk to you Tuesday at 2, he's either waiting for you to call him Tuesday at 2 or he sent you a text said, hey, I got to make it 2.05. I'm in, I'm in a meeting right now. Uh, if he says he'll be somewhere or he'll do something, he'll be there and he'll do it. I definitely blew you off a couple times because of work. I apologize still. <laughs> but you always told me it was, the, you know, hey, I'm, in, I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs in these uh, meetings right now, but let's do this at three or whatever it was. Uh, I tried. Wow. So how often would you guys talk? 
uh, every other day, sometimes every day, some weeks. And then, you know, sometimes we need to take a break and more go back to the drawing board and think, what else can we talk about? Like, what, what are we missing? And I would call around to my friends and like literally ask them for some stories that they could think of that may have been in the years I was heavily involved with them. And I'm like, all right, Dale, we got to get on the phone for three, four hours over the next two, three days so I can download you on this. And then we'd have a follow-up call to make sure that whatever was we wrote was accurate and fact check and do all that. We talked a lot, let's put it that way. <laughs> and I also, you know, once we had a, a two hour conversation on the phone, then I have to transcribe that two hour conversation on the phone. And mm -hmm. that's a pain in the rear end, uh, but it, <laughs> you know, it, it's what you have to do. I have to sit there with a the recording and play four words and type and play four more words and type. And that's the way you do it. That's I, hard. I, I bought Dale dinner two weeks ago and I probably owe him hundreds and hundreds more <laughs> for all the transcribe. Uh, the dinner was all, was really good, so I was fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So you guys have seen each other since? Once. Oh, Once. no, twice, because he came on Nesson too oh, uh, sure. the next night. Yeah, uh, we, we had the event uh, at Encore Boston, which was kind of the kickoff event. And awesome. then the next night, the Panthers played the Bruins, and Sean was on with me for the intermission. So I've seen him twice in two-plus years. Wow. And we wrote a book. It's good yeah. to see people, isn't it? We finally got people back in our event space, and I am like, I'm hugging everybody. <laughs> well, I don't know what. I live in Florida, and we've had fans for a year and a bit now, so it's a, yeah. a little bit different in my world. But one, I completely agree with you. I mean, it's uh, that was a tough, tough time not being able to be around people, and we're both people, people. So yes. I, I genuinely enjoy other individual's company uh, so yes. yeah it's not not easy i mean virtual events are good but you know i like i'm with you sean like i don't really want to see my face on the screen <laughs> yeah, i'm trying to figure out how to turn it off right now yeah, this, uh, no, I, I have control <laughs> this won't mean as much to sean as it does to people who are around here but my goal in life is to have the cover of our book on that wall across the street where you've got all the covers of all the books that's my goal in life is to have that over there Okay, I like that idea. So now for the paperback when that goes out. Um, yeah. Oh, so Steph wants to know, um, I got the book at the Encore event, really fun to read, and both of you were so nice. Did you have fun at the signings? Yeah, we did. We definitely did. Sean cool. doesn't like talking about himself, but he loves meeting people. Yeah, this is true. I love talking to other people, so thank you. And for he coming. talked to everybody. <laughs> I'm with you, Sean. You'll, have, you'll definitely have to come here next time you come up. I'd love to. Um, just come on in and meet people. And um, so Jasmine has another question. Jasmine, you are full of really good questions here. We so what, <laughs> what was your favorite place to eat and favorite thing about Boston, not hockey related? Oh, uh, another tough question. Um, He's a foodie, by the way. He's a yeah. legit foodie. Huge, huge. Oh, there's three of her there. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, I'm a huge food nerd. So uh, I actually have investment in a few restaurants in Boston. Um, my favorite restaurant, if I had to go top three, not including the ones I'm a part of to not, so, I, so I'm not self-promoting uh, any business, so I can tell you where they are if you want to go spend some money there. I really appreciate it. But uh, <laughs> when I get back to the town, first stop, is normally the Brewer's Fork in Charlestown. Uh, my second stop is usually Neptune Oyster. And then my third stop, if I have time and I can make it, would be Toro in the South End. Those are probably my three staples if I'm uh, if I'm going to going back to Boston. If I'm only there for a little bit, I try and get those three in for sure. Wow. And what are your restaurants, Sean? Uh, I'm an investor in Empire down in Seaport, uh, Red Lantern in the Back Bay. Uh, I had another restaurant with Wakefield and uh, Ken Casey and the drop kicks that went the way of the dodo uh, too quickly, uh, Turner's Yard. And then I have a small stake in uh, Versus, which is a, it's kind of evolved over time. It was like a supper club called Gem, and then it turned into a nightclub, which was not my favorite. Uh, <laughs> and now it's a, uh, it's like an arcade, uh, arcade restaurant bar. So you can go in there and play ping pong. Not the best restaurant or not the best concept at the middle of the start of COVID, but uh, yeah. we survived. It's, uh, we're around. Yeah. Well, I find the owner of our store is very conservative and we're just very careful. Just make sure. So it's been, there's a long time with no events. So you'll definitely have to come in. So, so I have to ask, do you live in Florida now and in, in, 
the intro, the foreword um, <laughs> that your friend wrote that you two had a boat together. So do you, and that you crashed it. Well, <laughs> so do you All right, he, he dropped a motor. I mean, it happens. <laughs> cutting through the coming through the cut and haul, and I may or may not have had to go around a buoy because somebody else is coming the other way, and it wasn't the best thing for the bottom of the boat. But here, no, there, uh, no boats in Florida. I live in the I live closer to the Everglades than I do the ocean. So, um, uh, yeah, no boats. Myself and Tuka, we got we finally got rid of that thing. <laughs> Oh, that is awesome. Great. So does anyone else have any questions? You can add them in the chat. If not, we will, um, I hear, I'm gonna come on and say hello, or say goodbye. Sean, it was awesome to meet you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dale. You guys will have to My come pleasure. in together. Here's the book. You can buy it next week. Dale's gonna come in the store to personalize and sign the book. So click on the green button and he will have it personalized and signed. And Sean, you'll have to definitely come in next time you come up. I would love to. I'd love to. I'm trying Beautiful. to figure out when my next. I've been up there a lot lately. I'm trying to figure out when my next time up there will be, but uh, be happy to swing by. Yes, we would definitely love to have you because I'm sure we're going to have plenty. We got plenty of books because we know it's. Uh, we love Thank our you. Bruins and Thank you love for our supporting. players. So. Thank you. For Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank right. you, Kim. Thank and you, guys. It was great to talk to all of you. Yeah, it was. So thanks for, question. it's very obvious you don't like talking about yourself, Sean. So thank you so much for spending this time with us. We appreciate it. Happy and to do I'll see you next week, Dale. I'll be there Tuesday. And that's the day All the book right. comes out. Yes. New title Tuesday. Awesome. All there. right. Take thanks care. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. Thanks, Dale. Thank thanks. Bye-bye.